Hello, and welcome to our virtual Farmer Shop Talk series. I'm your host, Amanda Gumbert, an Extension Specialist for Water Quality at the University of Kentucky. You are viewing the fourth of four conversations originally conducted in winter 2021. This virtual Farmer Shop Talk series was an opportunity to have meaningful conversations with farmers and experts about practical ideas and programs that can help you weather hard times and have success with stewardship practices on your farm. We thank you for viewing this recording and hope that this interaction leaves you recharged and sparks new ideas that are applicable to your production system or to those whom you serve. This virtual Farmer Shop Talk series was developed by a dedicated project team who work across the Mississippi and Atchafalaya River Basins at different land grant universities. With funding from the EPA Gulf of Mexico Farmer to Farmer Program, we have a long-term vision of improving farm sustainability and protecting soil and water resources. We also recognize the many challenges and sources of stress for producers. And while there are many risks and challenges on the farm, we know that there are producers who are methodically making calculated changes to their production systems in ways that are supporting their overall profitability as well as stewardship. While we had planned to be having these conversations as part of an on-farm field day, we are still excited to offer these farmer-focused interactions in a virtual platform. We hope that you find these conversations as meaningful as we did and that you leave each session with at least one good idea. Today, we have an all farmer panel who will talk about their perspectives on helping you nail down your next steps. Our farmer panel includes Mr. Adam Braun, an Illinois grain farmer, Mr. Cody Rakes, a Kentucky livestock and row crop farmer, Mr. David Arendt, a Mississippi small batch rice producer, and Adam and Betsy Lash, farmers from Wisconsin who do both livestock and row crop production. So we're, what I'm gonna do now, we're gonna get to the fun part. You all don't wanna hear me talk the whole time. Um, you wanna hear these other farmers and um, that's what I wanna hear too. So we have, um, we have five farmers on our panel and I'm gonna introduce all of them at first. And then I will um, start, I'll go back and we'll go through the lineup and ask them questions. Um, and so remember to use your chat and um, use um, that chat box to ask questions of us as facilitators as well as to the other farmers. Um, so um, please make sure you're utilizing that as much as you can. So we're gonna start out our first panelist is Adam Braun. And Adam, um, as um, you may know already, but Adam has been part of our farmer advisory panel for this project. And so we appreciate him being in that role, but also we wanna hear more about his operation. Um, he grew up on a grain farm in Vandalia, Illinois, which sits on the banks of the Kaskaskia River and is located about an hour east of St. Louis. So after college, Adam took a job in the heavy machinery industry and spent several years developing drive trains for agricultural and earth moving equipment. So I bet that has experience has paid off on the farm a lot, Adam. Our equipment always was needed repair. So um, he returned to the farm full time in 2012 where he raises corn, soybeans and wheat with his father. And upon his return, he began experimenting with cover crops and was instrumental in developing a new production system on his farm. Um, and this new production system is heavily reliant on conservation practices and soil health principles. Um, he's piloted the full system on about 30% of his acres and is currently working on scaling that system up across the farm. Um, but he is, um, likes to try new things and especially is interested in optimizing his farming operation. Um, so um, Adam Braun, we have two Adams. Adam Braun is in Illinois. So Adam, thanks for being here. Our next panelist is Cody Rakes. Um, Cody is the Director of Farm and Land Development at Mother House Farm. And Mother House Farm is owned by the Sisters of Loretto in Central Kentucky. And we, we're not gonna arm wrestle over what Central Kentucky, Cody, but he started that conversation in the breakout. Um, Cody is a University of Kentucky graduate from the Agricultural Education Program. And he was hired at Mother House soon after his um, graduation in 2015. 
He's managing 200 acres of row crops, 300 acres of pasture and hay for grass finished beef that's direct marketed to consumers, um, 300 acres of actively managed woodlands and a few acres of varying produce. Um, they had pumpkins and mums last fall. And, um, and so he deals a lot with that um, marketing and hosting educational events for farmers and non-farmers. It's a really interesting setup, um, the farm that he's um, managing. There are lots of folks who come there. And so he and his wife, Angela, um, do lots of marketing and educational opportunities for farmers and non-farmers. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that she's included because um, they, I, I have seen this firsthand and they kind of run as a team for sure um, at Mother House. Um, and we can't leave out their, their two kiddos and Rascal. Rascal is the, the main uh, attractant. He um, is the, the farm dog and he runs their social media. So um, it's always fun to keep up with what Rascal's doing on, on Facebook. Um, our next panelist is David Arendt. And um, David um, was formerly worked as a civil engineer before returning to the family farm in 2012. Um, he manages corn and soybean operation for Arendt Acres. Um, and he is, um, their farm is located in the Mississippi Delta. And um, he also runs Delta Blues Rice, which is their family owned farm to table rice milling company. And I'm really anxious, David, to hear more about that. Um, and it seems um, to be a really interesting specialized um, operation. But um, we also know that your farm has been recognized for your conservation efforts. Um, They've implemented surface water holding and reuse systems to capture surface water and improve irrigation efficiency. So I know one of our participants is really interested in irrigation. Um, and so um, we're really interested, David, to hear more about that um, as we move on. And then our two final panelists are a tag team also. Um, and um, Adam and Betsy Lash own and operate a highly diversified crop and livestock operation near Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Um, since implementing 100% no-till and cover crop practices, they have seen um, marked improvements in water in soil quality, water infiltration, soil biology, nutrient cycling, and decreased inputs. Um, Adam, you might, if you were here with us um, at our last shop talk, Adam was on our panel then and talked about some really interesting interseeding and mixed species uh, intercropping that they've been experimenting with on their farm. So we're interested in hearing more about that. Um, he provides consulting services as well to private non-farm groups and government entities and watershed communities. And when I invited Adam to be on this panel too, he said, well, I'm not gonna do it if Betsy can't be on the panel too. And so we're really anxious to hear from, from Betsy and her perspective too as we um, explore this idea that um, we're managing resources in stressful and hard times. So, um, so those are our panelists. And now I'm gonna start, um, go back to Adam Braun. And the, the first question, um, Adam, is, is this one is the easy one, right? So this is where you get to tell us anything that I didn't say about you and your farm that you want us to know. Um, and maybe tell us more about your production system that you mentioned um, that you're starting to implement and wanting to scale up. Sure. Um, I mean, you pretty well covered everything. I, I do farm with my dad. So you know, I, I came back full time, uh, worked at Caterpillar on uh, Challenger Ag tractors and, and some other products. But uh, Came back full time and and but and the only reason I mentioned my my past experience is because I I just I really enjoy building systems and you know in looking at our operation when we came back you know we were one or two passes of tillage and then you go through and then you you plant your acreage after you you know you apply your ammonia on your corn acres and it just didn't seem sustainable to me so I didn't really know what I was doing I guess or what I was set out to do other than I knew what we were doing wasn't working very well. And uh, we go from two articulated four wheel drive tractors, which is kind of, you know, something that I actually worked on where you actually have those on your farm and they're, they're I don't know whether it's kind of a, 
a uh, a thing for farmers, kind of like an ends. Once you get your you know scaled up to the, to the articulated four wheel drive bag tractors, and you've kind of you've kind of made it in farming. It felt like in our area, anyways, because you know that was they're they're the big guys. And if you look at our farm now, we've we've basically almost doubled our acres, but we have not a single articulated ag tractor, you know, and I have an affinity for that, but it's all thanks to just increasing your, you know, your planting equipment. And so it, your planting equipment and your spraying equipment and how it all interacts with, with uh, raising the cover crops. And uh, I mean, I, I run a lot of starters. I'm a big proponent of running starter fertilizers, get as much fertilizer in the ground underneath the surface as you possibly can, and uh, try to make it all fit across 3,000 acres, you know, with with two people in charge and some hired, some hired help is sort of challenging at times. So that's where I'm at in my system, I guess, without giving all the details, I guess. Great, thanks, Adam. We'll we'll take more information out of you as we go along. Um, Cody, are there details that I left out that you want to share with us about Motherhouse Farm and um, and some of the systems that that you're utilizing? Um, well, I'm kind of like Adam. I don't want to give all the details away just yet. Kind of give you a cliffhanger so you'll keep listening and pay attention as we go through the rest of the talk. Um, I'll just give a little bit more background about myself. I grew up. Um, I, I'm sort of what I would consider a first generation farmer, but my dad and my grandpa would have also said the same thing. <laughs> um, so my dad and I actually started farming at about the same time, uh, and my grandpa farmed after he retired. And so um, I, I helped my grandpa on his hobby farm, uh, as, as some people would call, uh, once he retired. And that's kind of where I got my, sparked my interest in agriculture. And we raised uh, tobacco, uh, hay, and beef cattle, and the hay, would, the hay was just to, to supplement the beef cattle operation. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm similar to Adam in, in looking at the system, and I constantly question the status quo. Um, I spend way too much time standing back and looking at what we're doing and deciding if that's the right thing to be doing. Um, but I'm anticipating that it's going to pay off, and I've already seen payoffs from that. Um, so, you know, just, just questioning the systems, questioning the production practices um, and standing back and looking at it and, and thinking, you know, we don't have to do it the same way we've always done it. And just because it may be working doesn't mean we can't do it a better way. And so that's, that's kind of something that I bring to the operation with me every day. And when I catch myself getting into that grind and that, that grudge of just having to get the work done, I make myself step back take the time and re reanalyze to ensure that what we're doing is the right thing to be doing. So just a little background about my mentality, I guess. Yeah, thanks, Cody. Um, Dave, anything important that I left out about um, your family farm or want to give us a little more detail about that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, there's actually a lot of similarities between myself and Cody and Adam. And uh, I grew up on the farm and um, Spent six years in the engineering field uh, doing water water systems design, um, you know, subdivisions, landfills. But during that time, it really made me interested in water and just the conservation of water, just even as an engineer. And so in 2012, I came back to the farm and started, started working with my father and uncle. And as Cody said, just kind of questioned a lot of things that we had been doing for a long time. There was, you know, just doing tillage, just just to do tillage, um, it just, it just, it just, you know, we're doing something to give somebody something to do, you know, it just sounded like we're wasting money. And I just kind of, you know, just kind of took a different viewpoint on, on different things, such as, um, you know, cover crops, you know, looking at cover crops to um, just try to ultimately save us money or um, just make us more efficient and minimizing those tillage passes, uh, just, just, um, just conservation, just being more conservation minded is uh, what I'm really, what I really enjoy about the farming aspect now and how could I improve the operation and make it uh, more sustainable for my, for the next generation that's coming behind me. Great, thank you, David. 
I'm, I'm interested to hear how the, um, how your engineering experience does play in with your irrigation and, and moving water. Well, water moves downhill, so that's the most important thing. <laughs> you don't have to change that, right? That's right. Okay, Adam and Betsy. Um, I, Betsy, I didn't have a, a lot of uh, information specifically on you, so you, yeah, you can just push him over to the side. And you tell us about what you, what your so, role is on the farm. So Adam and I work together. We're kind of like a, our own partnership, but I come from a very conventional farm. I'm a tiny head of registered bullion on my family farm. Uh, we ran about two thousand acres of row crops, and we cut out all of our steers. And what got me into changing a, into a different model was the fact that I was told every fall to go work up any of the wet holes with the big plow and have, I hated driving on any of the roads because in our area of the county, it does get, it, there's a lot of traffic. And so I hated driving from field to field. And uh, I also went, I have a bachelor's degree in dairy science from UW-Madison. So I was exposed to a little bit different, many different things up there. And when I came back to work on the family farm before I had my uh, work, uh, I uh, started questioning a lot of things that were going on too, like why don't we do more no-till um, and implementing some different things on there. And I was, it was basically a wall, like, no, this is the way things are always done around here. So I started questioning things and uh, learned a lot of different things from grass finishing, um, pasture management, just by reading a lot of books and watching YouTube videos. You guys hear us okay? Yeah, we're having trouble with your video, um, but your audio and your audio is mostly That's good. You don't, need to see. No, you don't need to see us anyway. So no, it was it was always interesting because every fall her family would go and work up every little wet hole in every corner of every field, and they'd never get them planted. So it's like at some point it's like, why are you working up every wet hole every year? And maybe one year out of 10, you'll actually get to plant it. So it was just stuff like that that made you kind of step back and go, what are you doing? You know? So one of the things that we've really, really enjoyed is the fact that we don't have anybody telling us no. So pretty much every, every practice is on the table. You know, um, we can get as crazy or as wild as we want to be, reason, but, but that is really like propelled us forward because when there's no one telling you you can't do that it really opens your mind to what what can we do how can we how can we get you know get above this and do some different things here you know so appreciate appreciate the opportunity yeah it's um i um, I, you know, I've already see a lot of similarities with our panelists of saying they just really come to the farm with with lots of big questions and question marks and, you know, kind of really looking at operations and just asking why a lot and um, and getting to, you know, how can we change things around and make things more efficient. So um, I think that that's probably a, um, a common mindset um, among a lot of farmers, but then Sometimes it is challenging if you have previous generations that you have to question and it takes a lot of courage sometimes to, to do that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and let Adam and Betsy, um, my, my question to you and right now, and thanks for giving us a little more um, background about your operation. Um, but my question is, have you done anything on the farm that has surprised you or had something really unexpected happen that, um, that you're willing to share with us and um, share what you learned from that experience? So we got the things. Um, her family came from a, if it wasn't a Holstein, it wasn't for milking kind of family. So we, we've, implemented a lot of crossbreeding, a lot of different um, cattle management type things, you know. I guess kind of working uh, human human kind of style of taking beef cattle uh, mm -hmm. and applying it to the dairy system. I wasn't impressed with how the whole Spina Association was going. And so I started crossbreeding and I started basically creating my own breed of cattle. Adam and Betsy, we're having trouble with your audio. If you'll um, maybe turn your video off, yeah, it might help if um, get your audio a little stronger. 
because we want to hear we want to hear what you're saying. We uh, we've been we've been utilizing our own genetics within our herd. So we we believe that any every every herd in the country has certain animals that are more adapted to your system than others. So a lot of the dairy industry, especially, is is constantly chasing numbers, looking for that that genetic you know package that is basically a unicorn. You're never going to get it. Meanwhile, they're completely ignoring a lot of the animals within their own herd, and. Uh, so we've, we've started to kind of keep genetics out of our own animals. And we're finding that now that we're into this, what, five years, we're really getting animals that are pretty problem free, pretty adaptable, pretty high producing for the system that we have, you know, um, and that kind of ties into the into the cropping system. All right, thank you, um, David, I'm going to ask you that same question. Um, have you done anything on the farm that surprised you or have, have, have you had something unexpected happen that you can share with us? You know, I would, um, I would say cover crops for me, you know, um, you know, I've, I've always, you know, read about cover, I mean, I've been doing cover crops probably for five years now and four or five years. And, you know, I've always read about them and, um, you know, cover crops in my mind are still kind of in their infancy phases as far as the, the, the long-term benefits. But but to me, the cover crops have have really, you know, it's it's helped us just reduce our tillage passes. And, you know, also like, you know, with chemicals, you know, where I have cover crops, I don't have near the weed pressure, like the winter weed pressure. Um, and that, that to me, I guess, is the most surprising thing with like with planting cereal rye. You don't see the winter weeds uh, that you would normally see just on a bare earth field. Um, and so, you know, you still have to kill the cover crops, but you don't have to do that, you know, that initial burn in application before you ever, before you ever plant because you're worried about weeds. Because, you know, I, I just plant grain into my cover crops and then I come back and kill it. And I, I haven't had any problems, you know, planting soybeans in the cover crops. They, they, they've yielded just as well as everything else. And and to me, you know, I don't have to put out dicamba where I have cover crops because the pigweed really isn't an issue where I have cereal rye. And so that to me, just not having to put that chemical out there, not saving that money, um, that's that to me has been a huge surprise to, to uh, for the way we farm. Excellent. Okay, Cody. Something that you've done that surprised you. Um, I'll tell you a, a, a little production story. So in 2019, we um, harvested some cereal rye that we'd planted in 2018. Uh, so we actually harvested that cereal rye for our own cover crop seed. Um, and in that mix, we also had some crimson clover. And so that crimson clover, we didn't kill it. We just let it go. We let it do its thing. Um, we, we felt like it was probably providing a little bit of nitrogen to the uh, cereal rye that it was growing amongst. And um, uh, so that cereal, that crimson clover that, that was that was mature when we harvested the cereal rye, of course, all that seed spread back out on the ground. And come that fall, we had the most lush field of crimson clover that I have ever seen in my life. Um, it, it, it looked like a wonderful stand of alfalfa from a, from a distance. I mean, it was just green and beautiful. And we were able to allow that uh, crimson clover to overwinter. And uh, we didn't have to plant anything in there for cover crops that year because we had all of that crimson clover seed left over. And um, it actually, we, 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 when, when we were looking at our fertilize for the following year, we we're going to have a corn crop in that field. And um, so we, we looked at that crimson clover and did some estimates and we figured, well, we might get uh, 40 units of nitrogen from that crimson clover. And so we backed off on our nitrogen by about that much uh, that we applied to the field. And that field actually yielded better than the rest of the field. So we figured we probably got about 60 units of nitrogen value out of that crimson clover. And that was kind of an accident that we had, um, but it, the point is that the, the cover crops, they build resiliency in the system and they give you flexibility. Um, if you have a barren field, what can you do with it? But if you have a crop growing in that field and you decide, oh, well, soybeans aren't profitable, let's see if we can go a different direction. Well, you've already got a cover crop growing there. 
you could take that to seed production. Um, so just it gives you flexibility and resiliency in your system to have your fields working for you 365 days a year. Excellent. That's a really good point, Cody. It's interesting to, to hear that you had that experience. Um, Adam, something that you've done that surprised you or had something unexpected happen? Oh, I could name a million things. <laughs> when you start talking about cover crops, you know, and things that surprise you, things that are unexpected, you run into to some different pests that you normally wouldn't maybe sometimes and and uh, so there, there's always a something new to learn and uh, anyways I don't know I, I guess I'm gonna date myself a little bit but in our area it used to be 50 bushel beans anytime you made 50 bushel beans those are pretty good that's when I was a kid all the way through probably college and, and whatever but in 2013 that was the year following 2012 2012 was uh just an absolute disaster in our area it was the very hot dry summer anyways we got a jump start on planting some cereal rye it got big and then it turned into a wet spring in 2013 and the the cover or the the cereal rye went from from you know ankle high to to head high kind of the snap of your fingers and here i am i've got like two or three years of experience using cover crops and I'm just absolutely almost freaking out because this stuff is head high and I don't know how to deal with it kind of thing. We got a little eight row, 16 row, eight 16 row splitter planter that we're pulling behind a little John Deere tractor and it, I can't even see the planter back there and back behind me because the, the cereal rise so high. It sounds like bubble wrap as I'm driving across it just pop, 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 pop as the beans are going in the ground. And, and uh, those beans came up and it just absolutely blew my mind. That was just like an epiphany to me was, was that year saying, okay, there's something to this. Not only did they come up and they looked wonderful, but there were some, some swag that's a very rolly field and it rolls down into a, some low ground. It's got some water pockets in it. They made in their upper 60s. And that, again, I'll remind you, that was when beans at 50 bushel the acre were good. And not only did they make in the 60s, they almost made 70. And it just it just absolutely blew my mind. So that was that was the like the confirmation bells ringing in my head that we got to figure this out. Well, that's those are those times where you need to kind of take a, a, a big exhale, right, Adam? You go, whew, yeah. Yeah, I was a little nervous when I couldn't see the planner. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Your dad was probably nervous too. Oh, way more nervous than I was. <laughs> well, it's, that's a story that nice lead in and we'll let you have the next question, um, Adam. And, and that is how has incorporating new conservation practices impacted your economic bottom line? So I just mentioned this, it has improved my yields. I, I feel like it's improved my yields on soybeans. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a big, big proponent of putting your nutrients in the right place at the right time. So I run a lot of starters on my planter. And if, if anybody's been through the I-70 corridor, you'll know that it's not really the typical what you might think of, of Illinois as. You know, we're not in the the heavy black dirt, uh, like the champagne that every champagne style uh, soils that everybody thinks of when they think of Illinois. We're we're more weathered. We're in an older glaciation area, and uh, we don't. Our organic matters are, you know, if the if they're one and a half to two and a half percent, you know, it's a pretty decent field, and uh, so we don't mineralize nearly as much nitrogen. But once I've started putting these these starter systems in to compensate for the additional carbon and and it's you know I say that it's not really compensating for the the additional carbon as much as it is you know um, for a hundred percent compensating for the additional carbon because well it depends on which mix you plant but you if you put that nitrogen right next to your to your uh, 
corn plants when they're young, when it's determining its ear size, it rows round and, and, uh, and that all happens when the corn's, you know, really small, but our, our corn yields have just exploded. So I just can't, I can't believe how much better my no-till corn is than what my conventionally tilled corn was before I started into this. So uh, that's been a, a huge, huge uh, impact to my bottom line. Again, I mentioned that I used to work on articulated four-wheel drives. They're gone. I don't have one on my farm. I was sitting there developing one. I have an affinity for four wheel drives and I don't own one. When they cost a half million dollars, or just say $400,000, and you put a high speed disc behind it, there's an additional $100,000. You got a half million dollar rig going through the field and it's doing absolutely nothing for you. Half million dollars in interest costs alone, say at 5% interest. You just paid an opportunity cost of $25,000. And that's just to own it. That doesn't include the amount of depreciation that your equipment's had on it or how much value it's lost over time. It doesn't include fuel. It doesn't include labor. It doesn't include repairs. Hires are expensive on those types of tractors. They're really expensive. So the $25,000 in interest is just a drop in the bucket. And I'm Thinking if you ran 400 hours a year, you could easily have another $100 an hour in owning it and operating it as far as labor and fuel and wear and tear. So that's an additional, what is 400 times 100, an additional $40,000. So you just spent $65,000 and you didn't gain not a single penny worth of value. So that's huge, and that's something that, that that gets overlooked sometimes. And I think it needs, you know, you need to examine that in your equipment lineup, saying, let's do a reality check here. So that's been that's been huge as as we've been uh, rolling through, switching our equipment line around. Yeah, those are really big numbers, Adam. It's um, it's hard for me to, I mean, I grew up on a small beef cattle farm and, and rolling hills, and I'm not sure that any equipment costs that much that, that we might have had. And we had these really old tractors that my grandfather tinkered on a lot. But yeah, that's, you know, those kind of dollar figures, you really do have to think about, you know, whether there's a payoff there or not. So that's a really good point. Um, Cody, next up, um, the question again is how has incorporating conservation practices um, um, influenced your economic bottom line? So I'll give a couple of examples. Um, obviously, the one where I talked about the, the nitrogen credits that we got off of the, the crimson clover, I mean, that was that was, that was was dollars gained right there. Um, and um, building nutrient resilience with cover cropping has, has been has been huge. Um, Last year, with crop prices down, I mean, hindsight being 2020, we'd probably done something a little different. But you know, when you're looking at three dollar and a quarter corn and and eight dollar soybeans, we decided, you know, we we couldn't afford to put the investment in fertilizer into those crops, and so we backed off on our uh, our, our our fertilizer inputs by about we only put down about 60 percent of what we typically would put down. Um, and uh, we had crop yields similar, right on par with, with our, our typical crop yields. And so I was just absolutely concerned and, and worried to death that when we got our soil test back, we were going to be just plummeted. And what we found is that we are flatlined or increasing. Um, and so, you know, I really think that these cover crops are building resiliency in our nutrient management. Um, and, you know, you, you hear this a lot in talking people that talk about cover crops and, and regenerative management styles. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, let's let's just let's just give it a try. And that was across the whole farm. It wasn't just one field that we just did that across the board. Um, and, and we saw several fields that, that actually increased in their soil test values. Um, a few fields that, that kept even and, and maybe one or two fields that, that went down slightly. Um, but overall, the, the trend looks upwards. 
So that was that was really big. Um, you know, those those are dollars that we that we saved by by not putting those nutrients down. Um, and uh, something I'll talk about in a little bit is is on the grazing side of things is stockpiling fescue. Uh, I know people are all over the place uh, geographically, but in our area of the country, uh, fescue, Kentucky tall fescue is our predominant forage base. And, um, you know, it takes a total mind shift to think, all right, I'm going to feed hay in the late summer and fall of the year when we have grass growing, everything is green and I'm going to feed hay right now. But the, the, the turnaround is right now I'm not feeding hay. I'm grazing cattle on grass that we grew when I was feeding hay in the fall. So when we were feeding hay in September, October, November, it was dry. We weren't making muddy messes all over the place. We could, we could allocate our hay in places where we wanted to uh, increase nutrient, nutrients uh, on those pastures. And then we turn around right now and we're, and we're grazing and we're not having to we're not having to get to get, uh, get the tractor out in the field and make ruts and messes. Um, and those are dollars saved. It's hard to put an actual number to it, but those are dollars saved in, in uh, uh, saved feed because those cattle are not wading through the mud. So they don't have as high energy need. They're, they're maintaining better. Um, w w us as the farmers are not, are not dealing with the mud uh, and, and the cold weather as much. Um, so grazing through the winter is a whole lot better than, uh, than grazing in the fall and feeding hay in the winter. So uh, that's, that's something else that's been huge for our bottom line. Yeah, thanks, Cody. We're in, in Kentucky in high mud season as probably much of the Mid-South is. Um, and winter, anytime you can streamline your wintertime feeding and, and not running up your fields, it's a good thing. So um, thanks for sharing that and a good tip for our livestock producers that are um, participating today. Um, okay, so David, you're next up. So again, the, the question is, how is incorporating new conservation practices impacted your economic bottom line? Okay, well, I've, I've already kind of mentioned this, but just with cover crops, just, um, you know, when you have a, a cover crop out there all year, you know, you so, like, so we're 100% we're irrigated on our farm. And so we pull, we pull beds, we pull rows up, plant the crop on top of that, and then we irrigate down the, down the rows, down the furrows. And every year in the past, kind of going back to what I said earlier about questioning things, uh, my, our, my father and uncle would want to pull those middles out to promote drainage. Well, when you have a cover crop that you plant in the fall, those beds don't wash down there in the winter nearly as much as what they normally would. And so you're still, you're going to be able to irrigate just fine. So you know, we don't pull middles anymore where I have a cover crop. So that's saving, you know, five to $10 an acre. That, that's a savings. Um, we know our, we know our nutrients are, are probably staying in the field better with the cover crops and the roots. Uh, don't really have a good number on how much that's saving us, but it, it's, it's, I don't think it's hurting us at all. Um, and then not having to spray quite as many chemicals on the fields is, um, I mean, that's that's ten to fifteen dollars an acre. Um, so you know, I have seen on some on some ground that's been some ground that's been in cover crops longer than others. I have seen a a yield improvement on soybeans. Um, I, this, this was the first year I saw it this past year, so we'll see how next year goes. Uh, see if I see that yield improvement on soybeans. But really, to me, it's just the being a better steward of what I put out there. Uh, you know, trying to save a little bit of money. Maybe my, you know, the cover crop costs me 10 to 15, $20 an acre, uh, depending on what I plant. But I feel like I recovered that um, just in the savings. And um, that, that's been a, change, a game changer for us. And then also uh, irrigation water. We do, a, we have a lot of tailwater recovery systems on the farm. My dad started that practice of, um, you know, putting weirs and ditches and then pumping out of those ditches and drainage canals. And I have, I've really looked for, we have a, we're blessed with a lot of ditches and rivers that run through the farm. And so I really look for more opportunities in those areas to, um, to pump, to pump water out of just because that, that's a cheap, it's cheap, it's a cheaper cost to uh, pump water, you know, pump surface water than pumping water out of 100 foot out of the ground. And it's just a better use of the resource. Um, so that, that's been a, 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 a good help to our bottom line as well. Excellent. So some saved electricity in there, I'm sure. That's right. Yeah. Okay, Adam and Betsy, 
um, how incorporating conservation practices has affected your economics? So we have, have got a lot of things. Being a first generation farm, we didn't have the luxury of anybody else's equity to work on. So kind of as I'm listening to, to David and Cody and Adam talk about their stuff, we have got a lot of the same things. We did not have the money for tillage equipment, you know, just to be, to be out there ripping up ground. So we went straight no-till right away. Okay. So it was been kind of a progression. Um, we started in doing the covers right away, not as a water management tool for drought. We're really wet. We're really heavy soil. So we actually used the cereal rye and a lot of the mixed covers as um, to grow the water out in the spring. So we get on the ground earlier. So that led us to basically the thought that roots are rebar in our soil and it helped with our trackability. Well, that bled over into the manure management side, whereas suddenly it's muddy right now. We just had a couple inches of snow. We can, we got a growing cover. We can get out there. The manure spreader will hold up and we're not wrecking our ground. So that led down that, that manure management trackability thing. Well, um, 2019, I don't know if anybody remembers, was incredibly wet and a terrible year. And I can honestly say we would not be farming if we had not planted covers in 2019. Because when you cannot get on that field for months on end because of the amount of water we have, um, the covers, we had no forage, we had no feed. You couldn't make feed. So we, we did get a couple windows where we could grow some, some alternative cover crops and we grew, grew big mixes because we had no idea what the weather was gonna do. We got good feed and we ended up being able to hold that for, for this next 20, uh, 2020, that helped us get through kind of getting through to the organic matter side. Um, since we started, I think on one of these fields in 2013, we have increased our soil organic matter from 2.6 to 4.6. And that gets to the whole nutrient placement, fertilizer use. We, we, we know to cut our herbicide rates because we're not tilling the soil up. Weed pressure is not an issue because we're holding all back all the weeds with the covers, you know? So kind of our big breakthrough was we're using multi-species cover crops on all of our acres why are we not trying to grow multi-species um, um, cash crops on these, on these acres the same way? And we're seeing some of the similar benefits, putting flax with soybeans, growing different clovers and, and um, different crops with the corn. We're gonna try some, some actually using a vegetable green bean this year on our corn silage. So um, just a lot of, it's kind of a progression. So boiling it down to one thing doesn't really work because on our, Farm, it was like kind of rotating around. One thing led to another, kind of led to another, kind of led to another aha moment. And when we've had mistakes that have translated into some of the cropping systems, um, our philosophy is, well, we have all different classes of livestock. We'll find something to feed it to. Yeah. So our mistakes get fed. Yeah. And that's kind of led us down the whole animal. It's the whole circle. You know, then we'll haul manure there in July instead of hauling it in, in September or whatever. So we, we've had that kind of thing. And I just got to tell one little story. The first time I no-till corn into a big green cover crop, I was so frustrated. I came home, I'm watching, as I'm planting out there, I'm watching all the neighbors, are, there's just dust flying all over the neighborhood. You know, you can look around and all these guys are working their ground. And I came home to eat lunch and I said, honey, and get some seed. And I said, honey, you married an idiot. This is never going to work. We just spent all this money. There is no way we're going to get a crop out of this. And it turned out to be in 200 plus bushel of corn. We were able to cut our fertilizer rates and cut our herbicide rates and it worked great and that was when we kind of went okay I, uh, I had to kind of talk them off of a lot I was ready to scorch it off and start over let's let's do something different because it was said, not going to work I said let's just wait let's see what happens we'll figure it out from there the slugs are going to get it the wireworms are going to get it we're not going to have a crop we just spent all this money we don't have that resource there I mean it, it was it was frustrating but but so I I have to say having a, a supportive spouse or, or a network to go to because you're going to have those days where, where everything you touch turns to, the, turns to manure and uh, that it, have, it helps having a, a support system there. Adam, I, I appreciate yours and, and Betsy's candor and honesty. And, and Betsy, I'll tell you that he told me that on the phone, um, the first conversation we ever had. And, and so he was, he was pretty, pretty clear on it and he was, he was owning that one, so. Um, if you haven't followed, there's um, some, some good conversation going um, in, the, in the chat. And there was a question um, back to um, Adam Braun about putting his starters in the soil. And, and the question was if he was banding those. Um, and then he responded that um, he bands them with um, his corn planter with two by two placement, a small amount of phosphorus in the furrow. 
and when he plants wheat, liquid phosphate gets injected right in the furrow. And um, talking about how that really also goes back to impacting the economic bottom line of getting much better use efficiency when you apply the fertilizers in the right place. Um, Adam, anything else you want to expand on about that? Not really. I mean, I, I you know, I, I keep going. Everybody heard of the Hefty Brothers. You know, I follow their old studies and and they say, you know, if you strip till or whatever, you banned your phosphate fertilizer, then they haven't seen, and maybe they've updated for a while. Maybe maybe they've updated since I've I've kept track, but I remember I remember reading that where they, you know, where they, they're basically strip tilling and they're using half the amount of fertilizer and they haven't mined their ground. So, you know, that that kind of gets gets me thinking, and I've seen it in my actual soil tests. You know, I we get we get GPS soil tests and, you know, get our nutrient readings and our, all of our, our maps back. And I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a, a big drop off on my phosphate levels in my soil. Although I have, even though I haven't been applying near as much uh, broadcast fertilizer, I still do apply uh, some fertilizer broadcast, but it's, you know, it pales in comparison to what I used to do. So again, the amount of phosphorus that I use is reduced and, you know, it's kind of a no brainer. It use less fertilizer, raising better crops, better return on your, on your money. Yeah, absolutely. And then that translates also into less likelihood of losing any of that um, fertilizer that your crops aren't using. So, um, absolutely. yeah, it all, it all does work together. And then there was some, another question about using cover crops in a, um, in a produce operation. Um, and and Keenan, thanks for dropping in a resource there from Midwest Cover Crops um, Guide for, for selecting cover crops. So keep your eye on the chat over there and certainly drop in questions um, if, if, you, um, if you have that. And Adam Lash, go ahead and, and speak up there if you'd like to about nutrient placement. I would just say, I mean, the number one thing we see, especially mistake for guys that go um, first year in covers is they don't have the system built to, to recycle the nutrients, kind of like Cody was talking with the, with the crimson clover. So ban that nitrogen, get something out there early, especially nitrogen for corn, um, the, the per, early in your system, because you're, you haven't quite built the, the structure, you haven't quite built the nutrient cycling, and a lot of those covers will take up any extra nitrate in the soil. Um, and steal it for the corn. So I agree, get it, get some nitrogen out there early with the planter um, to set yourself up because otherwise we've, we've had some train wrecks. We've, we've combined 140 bushel corn because we thought we could, could get away with it early in our system. And, you know, once we started putting nitrogen on the planter that really helped, you know. Great, are there other, um, other questions from our participants at this point for our panelists? Yeah. If you would like to, you can um, drop a, a question in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask a question if you like. We'll give our panelists a, a, a minute to take a breath and if anybody has a question. A, a thought that I've had uh, through this is something that I've thought about in the past and that's that if you look at industries across the board, they all invest in research and development. Um, and as just generally speaking, depending upon the industry, it's somewhere between five and 15 percent of their annual expenses and so that's something that i think about from time to time is is wh what are we doing with our 10 percent where are we investing our 10 percent um i mean you know if you look at you know 10 percent of your acres you're farming 400 acres what are you what are you doing on those 40 acres you know um what what kind of research are you doing what kind of development are doing what are, what are you playing with to try and and uh, improve your operation as a whole Yeah, that's a great point, Cody. Um, a question in the chat box came in. Any experiences sowing cover crops at um, at time of cover crops or at the V4, V6 stage? Did I butcher that question? Any of our panelists want to jump in on that? Yeah, anybody else? We, we've done quite a bit of it. I, it. A lot of it depends on your herbicide program. Um, 
and then which species you're planning on, on sowing at the V4 to V6. Um, we've found that in our area, we have to get them in a little earlier before canopy, certainly, otherwise they don't survive. Um, our biology is cranked up so hard that we can't keep residue on the, on the soil surface, especially in season in corn. So um, a lot of times the, the shading effect of the corn actually, actually gets our, our cover crops eaten faster. So um, certainly time, get them, get them, get them in earlier. We're, we're, we've even gone like shortly after, before the corn is even spiking, we've gone and interceded to try and get that timing a little closer. So um, you're going to have to play with it. it. It's very farm specific. I got friends up in Minnesota that they, because of the sun angle, they can go a little later. They get a little higher, higher sun angle. The further south you are, I, I don't have much experience with that, but I would imagine it's kind of similar to us. You're going to want to go earlier. All right, thank you all. Um, again, keep those questions coming um, there in the chat box. We, I'm going to go on to our next question, and Adam, you and Betsy um, kind of alluded to this with your comments earlier. Um, but my question is, um, you know, thinking about you know managing our resources and being good stewards in times of uh, um, of challenges and hard times. Um, what are some, uh, or can you describe for us? what your support system looks like, um, you know, what your emotional support system looks like, and is it helpful to have other farmers to talk to, or, or what does that look like for you all? Well, mostly Adam and I do a lot of talking um, amongst ourselves, but the biggest support system is just gonna kind of been relying on our faith. Like he talked about 2019 was a bad year for us, not knowing how we were gonna get feed made or any of that. and it really took a toll um, on us. And mentally, we just figured out, worked through everything ourselves, uh, talked to people. There's not a lot of young farmers in our area. And so that has been hard to try and find younger people who are getting in and farming, especially um, being like a first generation farmer and starting everything from scratch ourselves has been difficult. Yeah, I mean, we, we Twitter has been a good one. Networking, there's a lot of people. It's it's amazing with how isolating you can feel if you don't really get out the farm much. But there's a lot of good networks. Somebody mentioned YouTube. I mean, Twitter has been a good one. You got Facebook. Um, just we all have phones on our hips now. Call, reach out. I mean, we're all with technology today. It, that has been a, a real big benefit. Just reach out and call and and just start talking because it's amazing how many commonalities everybody's facing something at any given time. So, you know, that, that's all I can say really. Yeah, thank you. Maybe that's one good thing that has, has come from the pandemic is us really digging deeper into those electronic resources or resources that can come to us no matter where we are. Um, whereas we maybe used to have to, to leave the farm. Um, David, any uh, comments on your support system? What kind of uh, resources you have available that are helpful? You know, I would I would say you know first and foremost my faith that you know just being able to know there is a higher power and that's uh, a blessing for sure. Um, then also my wife, been able to talk to her about what's going on. Um, you know things that we're that we're struggling with. I mean she 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 does she doesn't have a farming background, but she sees the day to day struggles. Um, and then also, you know, just thinking about how, you know, things, things might. Uh oh, David has frozen on us for a second. David, I don't know if you can hear us. Um, that's, oh. that's really been the biggest thing for me. Can you repeat your last comment, David? You, your audio froze for a second. Uh, I, I said just the um, just thinking about the blessings that we have, just giving thanks for the good things that we have, even during tough times. That um, it's easier said than done sometimes, but um, that that's been the, the best thing for me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It is easier said than done for sure. I think most of us are pretty blessed with resources when we really stop and think about it. Um, Cody. Your thoughts on uh, your support system and other farmers or folks that help you out? Uh, I'll agree with what Adam and Betsy and, and David have said, and I'll expand on it a little bit more. 
Um, you know, I think falling back with your family, spending more time with your family. Um, I'm a big believer in investing your time wisely. And, and if you're investing your time into an operation that's not given back to you, maybe you should invest it somewhere else, um, at least until the operation can give back to you. So, so when I get stressed and when I get, I get bogged down, I step back and I go and spend time with the family. Um, but I'll tell you one of the biggest things that has, that has, has benefited us, uh, you know, Amanda mentioned earlier, my wife and I were, were both heavily involved in the operation and something that, that she, uh, we have, have both been very thankful for is that we got into direct marketing right before COVID. Um, the, the reason that that has been so beneficial is that it gives us a face-to-face. -face. It gives us, because when, when you're direct marketing, those consumers want to know how things are going. And when there's something like COVID going on, they have specific questions. Well, how's COVID influence and affecting you on the farm? Those kind of things. So it gives you a little bit of an, an outlet to be able to share some of your, your griefs and your concerns and your stresses and some of those things. And they and and your consumers, that your customers, they're going to be sympathetic and they're going to be they're going to be concerned and, and that's going to build a relationship that's going to go forward for quite a long time. The social media presence is also a, a place that, that gives us some relief when we have hard times. The hardest day for me on the farm is whenever I lose an animal. That that uh, bar none, I can lose money on crops, I can lose money on, on livestock, whatever, but losing an animal is is the big is the is the most difficult day for me. And so we are very frank. We share that on our social media account. Um, Rascal shares that for us uh, on 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 the Facebook page. And the feedback, the responses that we get from that, um, it, it doesn't make it better than before than 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 before losing the animal. But but it, it makes it livable. Uh, so having those relationships with people and getting outside of your bubble, you know. Uh, at one point in time, somebody told me, said, farming just seems like a very lonely occupation, you know, because you're out working in the fields all by yourself. And I said, well, that's, there's some truth to that. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know, we're, we're growing food for people. Why can't we connect with those people? And that gives a really good opportunity to, uh, to reduce that stress and, and, and cope with, with difficult times. Thanks, Cody. Those are those are good points, and and I will say that that Rascal is uh, he certainly is a, a good presence to have on on social media. Um, Adam Braun, what are your thoughts on um, support systems? Well, I'll be honest; it's been kind of tough. I mean, there aren't really very many people with cover crop around here. There just aren't. So I don't I don't have that many people to rely on. There's there's a you know, a person or two in the community that that has in the past and, you know, they sort of gave up on it for a while, but they were still a great resource that I would be able to reach out and talk to. So it's groups like this that I appreciate the most because it gives me an opportunity to sort of get out of my area. And you know, so this is kind of the second second thing I've participated in that, that's sort of done that for me. And the thing I value the most is the person to person interaction, you know, where these people have, you know, they might, it might at the surface seem completely different, but when you start digging down into the details, really it's the same problem that we're fighting against. And so there might be a, a little bit of a different twist to the solution, but, you know, when I talk to, to somebody like Cody down in, in Kentucky or Adam maybe up in Wisconsin, or a farmer all the way down in Mississippi. I mean, it, there's something that I can pick up from from just completely different geographies, and it just it, it blows my mind. So this, I feel like this is my support structure. To be honest with you, so I really appreciate that aspect of it. Well, Adam, thank you so much for your honesty, and, and we're glad that this is a helpful structure. You know, that's something as you were talking that, you know, I'm really thankful too that we, even though we wanted to be on the farm, and and how much fun would it be to get to go to everybody's farm and see what's working and what's not, and kind of have a, a traveling roadshow, um, but the efficiency is just not there for it, and and so that has been a good thing about moving to a virtual platform is. Um, you know, we can, we can all be in where we need to be in an hour, but um, 
but we can connect with those and get ideas and, and support. Um, while we've been chatting about that, we've had some good conversation that's going on over in the um, in the chat, we had a question about, um, and I'll ask any panelists that would like to answer, um, how are you incorporating livestock or cattle grazing into cover crops? I don't know, Cody, if you've grazed any cover crops and if you want to make a comment about that. The grazing cover crops is another way that we've really built resiliency into the system. Um, one of the one of the issues with, with spring is that you have so much growth and uh, uh, in, in typical pasture scenarios, the cattle will keep that, they keep those pastures grazed off uh, and, and they're, they're grazing off that really lush new growth and they're not getting the nutrients that they need. So, so grazing cover crops has, has done a couple of things for us. Number one, it gives us the ability to let our fescue pastures to get some, get, get some growth built up before we go out and start grazing those pastures. So that whenever they do go in there, they're not just grazing that fresh waterlogged uh, new growth that doesn't have hardly any nutrients in it. Um, the other thing is that it's 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 essentially free feed. Uh, we're able to use those um, we're able to use those those cattle to kind of manage the biomass that we're producing, uh, especially getting early on in cover crops. We were we were concerned about you know being able to plant into that that cereal rye like Adam was talking about that's that's over your head or it's it's as tall as a tractor or whatever. So we're using the livestock to manage the height of those cover crops. Um, and, and we're actually, we're jump starting that nutrient cycling. Um, so we, we've grazed cover crops in some times when we thought that, um, you know, we would, uh, uh, it was a little wet and we thought maybe we were gonna have issues with compaction and those kind of things and see some negative results. And, and what we're seeing is that the overall benefits outweigh some of those, some of those negatives. Um, so, so grazing cover crops has been, has been fairly successful for us, um, both in the fall and in the spring. Um, for example, we've had some situations where we've taken, we've harvested wheat and uh, didn't come back with double crop beans because we didn't think they'd be profitable. So we planted a summer cover crop and grazed graze those fields. Uh, and and when, we do, when we do grazing on cover crops, we use a strip grazing technique um, so that so that cattle aren't wandering the entire field for the duration of time of the time that they're in there, we're giving them an allocation of one or two or maybe three days worth of, of grazing area, and and then moving them on to the next area, and not giving them access back to where they were. So we're limiting the the travel that those animals are doing, so that we're not hope hopefully we're not getting quite as much of a compaction issue out of that. Any of our other panelists using? Um, livestock with cover crops? Yeah, so we do not necessarily a lot of grazing uh, on our heavy clay soils. It's hard to get like the milk cows out there. They just muck everything up. And then a lot of our fields are also a couple miles from our home farm. And so we started utilizing a concept of um, zero, grazing. zero grazing, which I use over in Ireland. They see a lot they have a lot of wet springs and summers. And so we started feeding green feed to our cows utilizing the zero grazing method. So we go out and we cut grass. Uh, we actually um, use my dad's old John Deere stacker and for a flail mower and use that to feed grass in our mixed uh, covers. Yeah, we, so we've seen some cattle health beds. We would love to graze more, but we just, one of the best things we've seen as far as grazing on cropland is to get it out like graze cereal rye with cows or cow calf pears or, or heifers ahead of soybeans. You can plant the beans a little bit later. We don't really give up any yield. Um, it rests the permanent pastures for a month or, or even a couple weeks and then um, go in, graze, plant your soybeans, scorch everything off. Beans come up through, you got that biology turning. It, it, it has been a game changer on, on early season management and, and it's feed. I mean, it's, it's feed out there. And, and uh, if you got fence, a lot of guys spend a lot of years ripping out fence and we're, we're trying to put more fence back in. So. Thank you. I'll call your attention too. There's some good conversation about in the chat also about negative yield effects from covers especially um, ahead of corn. And so check those comments out. We are quickly approaching, amazingly quickly approaching the end of our time together this morning. And, and I wanna pose um, 
one more question that I have for our panelists and give them ample time um, to answer um, that question. And um, Adam Braun, um, this is your warning, you're first out of the gate. So um, the question is, um, have you ever had one good idea on your farm? Um, maybe you gained that from another farmer, from attending a program or some other aha moment that has been a real game changer on your farm. Absolutely, I've got a secret weapon. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I kind of kind of regard it as that, and then actually came from my experience back at Caterpillar. Uh, oddly enough, the former coworker of mine got a D10 stuck at the proving ground. And you think a D10 is a huge bulldozer and it's really, really heavy, but it's got really narrow tracks on it. It's made for pushing rock and things like that. He told me they got it pushed out with a, a little D6. A D6 is a much smaller tractor and sometimes they've got really wide tracks. On them. So lower ground pressure. And when I hear everybody talking about, you know, everybody worried about getting out into their fields and making a mess out of it. And that's, that's like the cardinal sin of no tilling is, you know, that what if what happens if you make ruts? What happens? You have to get your cultivator out and you have to go fix your issues. So when kind of at the onset of, you know, basically my system in the cornerstone, way back in 20, again in 2013, when I was talking about that that cereal rye cover crop, I sprayed that field, the rye with my Challenger 55, that's a belted Challenger with a sprayer, boom, mounted to the three point hitch. So when you think about the dynamics there, you've got a belted Challenger running through a field, you can go through standing water and not leave a track. So it's it's pretty incredible because there's no there's no load behind you, just these tracks, they, they just roll down. And I actually did the calculation. It was something like a ground pressure of somebody walking across the field. So if you're not making a footprint, then my tractor, my sprayer, won't leave a track. So that's been my secret weapon. I don't let my cover crops, if I'm, if I'm worried about it, and I was highly worried about it when I first got started cover cropping, that was my biggest worry in the world is what happens if things get out of control. And that was my insurance policy to say, I can go out and I can spray anytime I want to, and I can do it lighter than any light foot sprayer that I've ever seen before. So that's that's my secret weapon. That's awesome, Adam. We didn't know you were a ninja also, but we're glad, <laughs> we're glad to hear that. Um, okay, Cody, your one good idea. Um, I think I'll go back to the stockpile fescue uh, discussion. So, uh, the reason that was that's my one good idea is because it's something that people have talked about forever. I mean, in in the central Kentucky area, or just in in the in the livestock production world, particularly cow calf forage based systems, uh, you know, stockpiling fescue has been talked about since well before I was even a thought. I was even a thought. So, um, you know, it's not a new idea, but it's just an idea that people are still having a difficult time wrapping their head around. And so once once I got my head wrapped around that idea you know feeding hay in the fall allowing the grass to grow and, and stockpile and then grazing that grass through the winter time um it, it kind of led me down this road of well what other things can we change and modify and uh improve upon so then we we got into because we did the stockpile fescue we started more doing more rotational grazing to 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 utilize that fescue that we had stockpiled um, and so that that got us into the next year we started trying out some summer annuals and and for grazing and then we started grazing cover crops and 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 we just continue to increase the intensity of our of our grazing management system uh, just like we're increasing the intensity of our cover cropping and, and things like that so um, stop pop fescue but just in general it's 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 questioning and, and adapting to new ideas and situations Great, thank you, Cody. Um, David, your, tell us about your one good idea. Okay, uh, this this idea, um, I, I know I'm, I'm one of the, from what I can hear, I, I'm one of the few that do, that do irrigate, but just when I came back in 2012 to the farm, uh, just installing moisture sensors on our fields, just so that I knew when to irrigate my farm or irrigate my crops instead of 
hold into that mindset of a year, get every seven days just because that's what we've been doing. Uh, stretching it out to two weeks, you know, 20 days, whatever, based on and, and turning the pumps on based on what the soil soil tells me and what the plants are using, not just because I want to have a weekend, you know. And so that's um, that's been a big, a huge uh, game changer for our farm. Excellent, especially when you're, um, you know, in a place that sometimes you may have limited rainfall or you may have enough and a lot and, and certainly using it wisely is a good That's idea. Right. That's Absolutely. Right. Okay, Adam and Betsy, tell us about your one big, good idea. Our big thing is grow something. The only way we can get energy into that soil is through a plant is, is that's what we found is the plants will fix soil they'll fix dirt into soil so our biggest thing is if you're spilling sunlight I mean there's some comments here about grow um, killing the covers ahead of the ahead of the cash crop if you're spilling sunlight when it when it is the most intense it can possibly be that is inefficiency in the system so we are trying to grow something all the time I hate seeing bare soil I hate it I hate it I hate it and we have found that, that our yields and our carbon flow and organic matter and everything is built up when we started growing covers and pumping those root exudates more of the year. And that's what's got us down the, the multi-cropping thing. Let's try and capture, let's try and get as much photosynthetic activity all the time. So, Beth, do you have anything? No, that's pretty much it. I mean, a lot of our, our ideas, uh, it's been grabbing from this person and this person and implementing them and it just keeps, it's like a snowball rolling downhill. You just start changing something and then keep going with it until it's, everything's really That's the other thing is resources out there, a lot of. Uh oh, Adam and Betsy, we've, we've lost you. you. You're frozen for a second. I don't know if you can hear us or not. Well, we're hoping that they will come back to us and oh, there, there you're back, Adam and Betsy, you froze for a second. Oh, if you'll unmute yourself, the, um, Cody had a question. Do you all have multi-species of livestock, Adam and Betsy? Yeah, we had, um, we have beef cattle and dairy cattle. So we run a, a mixed herd as far as um, like the heifers and the young stock. We did have a couple hundred hair sheep used, but I don't know if anybody knows about hair sheep is they they're a lot of work so we uh we we got rid of them just we did not have the time to mess with sheep getting out and they were hard to manage hard to graze like sheep but can't they, they took a lot of time so yes we've done the mixed species flirt um a lot of poultry we've done a lot of that and uh we we found we had to prioritize our time that was kind of the big thing. Dairy was our cornerstone. Beef came in. Beef are our gar garbage cleaners, so they clean up whatever's left. Um, the, the getting to the direct marketing, the eggs has been really a good thing, um, and the sheep sheep were good, but they just didn't didn't quite fit with our system, like we liked. Well, folks, we um, I want to thank our panelists um, very much for um, sharing your insights, your experiences, and and being honest and um, a little bit vulnerable to to wondering what kind of questions might come up for you. So we we thank you so much um, for that. We are um, at the end of our time and a little bit past. Um, folks are welcome to stay on and continue with the conversation. Um, but I also want to be respectful of your time and, and, and certainly know that everybody's busy and have lots of other um, hopefully outdoor activities to do. Um, Erica has launched a poll for us. Um, and so if you'll take a minute and respond to those questions, really, it's just about um, what you thought of um, the, the webinar today and, um, and what your thoughts are for us moving forward. I'll let you know that you'll receive um, um, an evaluation, we'll probably email those to you um, in the, the near future and get your thoughts and response back to um, your thoughts of the whole series if you were on multiple sessions. Um, and if you just um, attended this one, that's great too. And we just want to hear your comments and feedback. Um, also, um, to let you know um, as well that we have recorded all the sessions and those will hopefully soon be posted. Um, on our um, registration and, and web, our website for um, the events. And we'll share those websites with you too as soon as those are posted. So if you missed a session and you wanna go back and hear 
um, thoughts or comments from some of our other speakers, um, we welcome you to do that as well. Um, so at, at this point, folks, thank you again um, for being here, for taking the time and participating. Again, we really were hoping to be um, probably on the Lashes farm um, in, um, in Wisconsin, but um, at maybe some point we'll get to do it, but you sound that you looked very surprised. We were, we were well, those had been some internal conversations, but um, since we shifted to a virtual platform, uh, we are, we're glad that we were able to have all of the participants that we were able to have, um, knowing that if we were in person, we wouldn't have had all the same folks. So um, thank you again. Thank you for your responses. And um, everybody have a great week and a good growing season. So thank you. If anybody wants to hang out, I wouldn't mind staying on in a little while to talk. Oh, great. Thanks. I'll hang out Howdy. for a minute or two if anybody has any questions or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll stay for a second as well. Awesome. Maybe give you all an opportunity to, to question each other. Uh, well, this is David Spidell, and uh, I'm not a beginning farmer by any shape or fashion, uh, but I, I did mention I have some grandchildren, and this issue of uh, eating healthy and organic farming, any comments on that from the uh, beginning farmers? Well, I, I'll give my, my personal take on it is um, I'm really not a big fan of labels because I think it puts you in a box that you're not able to get out of. And, and so that's the reason that, that we don't, we're not, we are not organic. Although we follow a lot of organic practices and protocols, we, we are not uh, organic certified. And, and, and I just, I'm not a big fan of those labels. Now I think that those labels have their place. And if you're in a situation or a market area where you can get some financial benefits from those labels, then that's something that you should utilize. Me being in rural Kentucky, um, it's not going to give me any, it's not going to give me any marketing advantage over another direct marketer to have organic produce or to have organic beef or anything like that. Um, so to me and in my interactions with the consumer is that they are much more interested in hearing the farm's story and not as concerned about the what what the government labeled term is and so if you can have a direct connection and a direct interaction that is how you build customers and those customers are going to keep coming back they're going to share your story with their friends um, and you're going to you're going to you're going to build a customer base that way and i think that for a new and beginning farmer uh, direct marketing systems are going to be the key to uh, to to being a, having a profitable operation, some kind of, of of differentiation from the other products that are out there. I'll speak a little bit to that as well. And with our so, I mostly talked about corn and soybeans, but we also grow rice, and we grow rice for you know just for standard production practices, like most of the farmers in the in the Delta do. But we also have a small amount of rice that we grow for our rice meal, Delta Blues rice. And some of that rice um, is grown organically. And we have some acres on our farm that is certified organic. And, but our, our rice meal is not certified organic just because they take, it's just an extra. So, I, so I, on my bag, I can't put uh, USDA organic certified. I can tell you that it's grown organically, but I can't put that on my bag because my meal isn't certified because it was an extra expense. And, it, Mostly because they would take, they would just take some of my profit. It seems like, and but I, I'll tell you this: it, it is a lot of work um, growing organic rice. Like you have weeds that you have to go in there and pull out by hand, and it's my me, my myself, and my sixty-five year old dad are out there working. It, it's if we were much bigger organic, I would kill us. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work, um, and it it has its place for sure. Um, but as far as feeding the world, I don't know how you do it organically. I mean, um, I, I, a lot of, a lot of consumers want it, uh, but it's, 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 it, and it has its place and we, and I'm not really charging anything. I'm not charging anything extra for that acre that's, that's grown organically. Um, my prices are already high for our, for our rice, but I don't think I can charge anything extra for that organic certification.
Well, I don't want to dominate the questions, but uh, Cody, you mentioned you're in Kentucky and you have livestock. Uh, last month in February, it was very, very cold here, and I noticed some of the cows didn't eat the hay like uh, they had in the past. Did you have to supplement your livestock when they're out there grazing? So this you, may, you may have heard that I said we're a grass fed, grass finished operation. That doesn't mean that we don't feed a little bit of grain from time to time. Um, and 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 the the uh, the way that I explain it to our, our our customers is that yeah, we we do feed some grain from time to time. Primarily, it's an attractant. Like if we're trying to get them to move and they don't want to follow, if they don't know what that bucket is, then we don't have that tool to use. So we try to keep that tool available. So we did feed a little bit of ground corn uh, to, to the cows uh, in that cold weather, just trying to supplement and keep them, keep them active and moving. Um, and with the ice on the ground, we weren't able to graze, but the ground was frozen so we could get out there and unroll hay or feed hay or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, our cattle, they cattle typically handle cold weather better than they do hot weather. Uh, especially in the in the fescue in the fescue area where, where cattle can't uh, manage their their body temperature as well as as uh, some that aren't affected by the fescue so uh, so I, I, I think that uh, the, the conditions we had weren't extreme uh, now if we'd had new calves being born on that frozen ground that would have been a concern um, but we actually calve in a barn to to eliminate those kinds of issues and also issues from predators too so um, we did supplement a little bit with a little bit of grain, like uh, two pounds of grain per head per day, you know, on, on, on mama cows. So that's not, not anything significant at all. Just a, just a little uh, uh, boost to keep their bellies warm. So you don't think you lost any weight with that cold weather? No, we've, 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 uh, we've actually weighed some of our feeder cattle since then, and they, they continued to gain right through that. So Adam, I'm actually really interested in, in interceding. You know, you guys have a unique set of challenges that far north. And, uh, you know, I've never really done interceding, but it, I think that's where the future lies. I mean, I was at a Wheat Growers Association meeting, I think last winter before they shut everything down. And they had a, they had a test plot. Of course, it was a herbicide study and they had uh, soybeans interceded with wheat, and that's why I was going to call you the other day, because you were interceding with your soybeans. But it, the interesting part was they eliminated herbicide pests, but they used the wheat right at the planting. And one thing they didn't expect was that the soybeans had a higher oil content. So I mean, there there's a lot of symbiotic relationships that that go on there, and you know. I just kind of want to pick your brain sometime as far as the interceding. I mean, we're far enough south. I, I flew on some covers last year for the first time, and I'll be honest, it, it really didn't work that well for me because even though they were calling for a hurricane to blow up here, if we got like a tenth of an inch that during that storm system, and it just, it was a flop. So that stuff set on the, on the ground, and I mean, it, the fields are turning green because it finally started raining in October, but I felt like my stuff with my drill has been, you know, kind of, kind of my, my go-to and my reliable thing, but there are only so many acres you can cross with a drill when your main priority is getting the crop out in the fall. So, I mean, I got to figure something that's out. That's exactly, no, that's exactly what we've noticed too. I mean, seed falling out of the sky has not been good for us. I mean, I, I have tried interceding. We'll side dress our corn with uh, dry urea, urea, ESN, and, and agritain, and AMS. And I've put seed in there and broadcast that at various times. Uh, my biology is, is cranked up so much that our worm load, um, our, our insect populations are so high, seed laying on top of the ground just doesn't. It, it gets eaten before it gets a chance to even grow. And, it, yeah. and so I've really refined this, like, okay, looking at what's, what are we trying to do? We got that acre of solar panel out there. It's all about sunlight capture. So I, I kind of disagree with a lot of guys that are trying to intercede into corn. It's like you're, unless you're going super low rate corn, which, which we've, we've actually backed down our corn populations in an effort to try and keep, um, to let some sunlight get down to the interceding. If you're going for maximum corn production, you need that maximum some solar panel for that corn as efficient as possible. So 
you know, some guys are doing, you know, cowpeas or, or different things that way. Well, every plant that's there taking sunlight away from the corn is actually going to hurt your yield on the corn side. So if you're trying to manage for a corn crop, let's manage for the corn crop. Well, the way we get around, let's get some of the same benefits of the cover crop, but let's go longer into the season. Let's go later or later into the spring or earlier into the fall and capture that sunlight a different way. And um, as far as the soybean thing, that has been, that I think is one that we could work with because corn doesn't like competition. You know, you screw up your ear set, you screw up your, your ear fill late in the season, you get potentially, um, you know, weed issues. Soybeans are a little more forgiving from what I've seen, whereas companion cropping, their stress is, is late in the season that they don't like stress. We can, we can, we can be pretty aggressive early in, on in the season. So you can plant them into really nitrogen, nitrogen deficient soils which is why we love rye so much. We want to put them in a nitrogen deficient state to force them to nodulate, to force them associate with the bacteria in the soil. So starting there, well, okay, what else can we do? Part of the, the thing is you build that gigantic factory early in the season, you're gonna have really tall beans coming late at, later on in the, in the fall. So what we've thought is, well, let's throw, let's throw flax in there. Let's try and use up some of that late season nitrogen. It never really competes with the beans. If you look at the way a flax leaf is, it's real thin and it's, it's kind of a wispy little plant. There's not a lot of, not a lot there. So let's keep, keep something growing. It, it's highly mycorrhizal. So let's feed that mycorrhizal later in the season. Um, we're trying to, trying to capture different, you know, we, we know the constraints of our system. We've only got an acre to work with and we know we only got so much sunlight going to fall on there in a season. If water is your limiting factor, then you got to figure that in there. Water is rarely our limiting factor. We've got a four foot gravel layer that has all the water you could ever need. So if I can keep punching roots down, I got moisture coming up all the season. So play, you gotta play with it. Um, but I, my, in my mind, interceding into corn, I, I'm trying to figure out what it's doing for us, you know, that the corn crop isn't. Maybe maybe uh, back down your corn maturities and just get out there earlier. Um, you know, I, you have any thoughts? it's a hard one you know it's a hard one diversity in our system has really helped because we're growing so many different crops I'll any other thoughts there cody i'll agree that that the the you know the the planting cover crops in the fall and harvesting and, and doing all those kinds of things is it's just becomes a, a, a you don't have a job anymore you have a life <laughs> <laughs> or you don't have a life however you want to look at it you know that's all you do is live is is eat breathe and breathe and sleep uh you know farming at, at that time of year and so one of the things that we did this past year was we actually put a cedar on our combine so we are uh broadcasting seed under the corn head as we're harvesting corn and we had we had pretty good results out of that in the early season the later season stuff that we did um, we didn't have very good results um, and it was actually part of a strip trial, so we didn't go back and drill that. Now, we had time. We could have went back and drilled that, and we would have had good results. Um, but uh, I think in a year where you're, you're running into to moisture issues and, you, and you're too wet, I think that would be a year when that, when, that inter, when that seating under the combine head would really shine because you've got the moisture there. You're getting, the, you're getting everything coming out of the back of the combine on top of that seed, Plus, where we've got it, it's actually up under the snout. At the point of the snout is where we're scattering the seed. So we're getting the stalk, the leaf, everything is scattered on top of that seed. So we, we, had, we had really good results with that earlier in the season, and we got a little bit of moisture on it. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see how that, that helps us going in the future. And you're talking about equipment costs. Drills are an expensive piece of equipment to keep, to keep on hand, too. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly small scale. But, you know, I figure it cost me about 10 or $12 an acre to maintain and, and own a drill. Um, so if I can, if I can seed that with the combine, that combine is going over every acre anyway. Um, you know, I'm going to, I've got 10 or $12 an acre right there that I can afford to, to uh, invest into that, that uh, technology. So. Thank you for joining our virtual shop talk today. You can find more virtual shop talks on our website.